Hey everyone, David Geisler here with NGIM. Our uh, NGIM staff joining us tonight is Brian Henson, uh, the Director of Youth Apologetics and Evangelism for NGIM. I'm so uh, excited, Brian, that you're here with us. Um, also joining us tonight is one of Brian's former high school students that he taught, Christian Fernari along with Kaylee Miller, who is a concerned mom of very young kids. So we're gonna have a very interesting program tonight, different uh, perspectives from different people, uh, uh, different walks of life, so to speak. So uh, thanks so much everyone for joining our discussion tonight. Um, tonight, we are discussing another battle that we as Christians need to fight. And I'd like to begin by sharing a perspective. Some of you may have heard me say this before. My father, Norm Geisler, taught that we need to fight at least four battles. Do you remember what they were? The battle for truth, the battle for the Bible, uh, the battle for the resurrection, and the battle for God. But I also realized that before we fight these battles, there's another battle that all parents need to fight at home, which is to equip our children and what they believe and why they believe it and how to apply it, um, which is something that my father taught me. He taught me all those things. And in fact, my passion and heart for evangelism uh, came about because of all that my father taught me about applying apologetics in the area of evangelism. And that's why we wrote this book called Conversational Evangelism. Now, uh, at our ministry at NGIM, we wanna cultivate generations who are grounded in their faith and who choose to actively put Christ first in their lives. So tonight we wanna to discuss how to do that as a parent, uh, a grandparent maybe, an aunt, an uncle, a teacher, or a friend, or a neighbor? How can we equip those kids that are in our circle of influence? Now, Kaylee, I understand that you're a mom of two girls that are almost one and almost three, but um, little kids can understand a lot more than we realize. Do you find that true? Uh, for your own kids? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, our, our girls are only one and uh, three, but uh, they understand so much, much more than we can imagine. And they're, um, they're like little sponges. I, I love that about kids. They're just wow. taking in and absorbing uh, everything that they see and hear. So. Yeah. Now, Kaylee, I don't know if you've heard my story before, but I became a Christian when I was five years old, my dad was a pastor of a church. And, you know, even I think when I was four years old, he started talking to me about what it means to be a Christian. And so I basically even kind of had some basic theology <laughs> when I was four, four and a half, something like that. And I remember when I was five years old, he asked me, you know, have I made the decision yet to, to trust Christ? And I told him I hadn't. And so after church one night, uh, church after the service on Sunday morning, I went down to my Sunday school class and got on my knees and I prayed to receive Christ. And I was five years old <laughs> and there was nobody else in the room. I was the only one there. So, I mean, I was five years old and I already understood I was a sinner, that I needed Jesus to forgive me. And I knew that by inviting him into my life, he was going to change my life um, and help me to be more of the kind of person he wanted me to be. I knew all that at five. Now, um, so I know that it's true that kids can understand a lot. Now, let me give you one more example. My youngest daughter, Rachel, uh, became a Christian when she was four and a half. She beat me by about a half a year. And I think she understood it when she was four years old. Let me tell you why. Um, many times when she was at the age of four, she would go with her mom and her older sister and brother to an abortion mill here in Charlotte, 
where my wife would try to talk to ladies, uh, try to talk them out of aborting their babies. And in the process of doing that, she would hear a lot of evil things that people would say towards my wife and those who were trying to reach out to these ladies. And one day she said to me in the car as we were driving, she was only, um, she was only four still. She said, Daddy, God exists, but there's some people who pretend like there is no God. <laughs> and that's at four. And then about four and a half, uh, she prayed to receive Christ into her life. And, um, you know, uh, when the movie came out, uh, the war, was it uh, the movie on prayer? She had a, like a, a prayer wall and she was praying for people. And I mean, <laughs> she's an amazing, uh, you know, young lady now but i mean even when she was younger she was really amazing and she understood so much so to all that to say or to ask uh kaylee um what are you trying to do with your girls even at a very young age what are you trying to do to help them understand uh the christian faith and why it's important to to you uh to start at an early age like this just kind of give us some feedback as a mom yeah, well, I mean, as we talked about, kids are sponges, and so they're learning and absorbing every little thing. So I also look back at my um, my own childhood, and so I know that I was learning scripture and um, going to church and uh, hearing from different people speaking, and so that's all really important. So uh, kids, we need to take advantage of all the time that we have with them. So we want to start right from the very beginning. So even if they're too young to understand, we know that they can they can memorize and they can repeat. So that, that's where we're at with our girls right now. Mm. So we're focusing on teaching them scripture um, and we do it in a lot of fun and engaging ways. We love to um, do scripture to music. Um, we also spend time as a family studying scripture so that they see uh, my husband and I Right. learning God's word. And so that excites them and that makes them more engaged in it. Mm -hmm. um, and the Deuteronomy 6 passage also um, is really always in my mind. Mm -hmm. And Deuteronomy 6 talks about uh, talking about God's word all the time, when you rise, when you lie down at the table, when you're walking. And so that's kind of what we've embodied in our home. So mm -hmm. we try to talk about God wherever, whenever we can. And it's really amazing. I mean, our our daughter's only three, not even yet. Right. And she's already got a handful of scriptures memorized. She's got several uh, verses from some hymns. Uh, just uh, this past week, she's been working on memorizing um, the uh, prayer that um, our Father who art in heaven. It's so it's so cute, but it's also so important because even even if she's not fully understanding everything that she's saying, we know that she's gonna remember this in the years to come. So we're building that foundation right now and she's always gonna have that. That's great. That, that's really amazing what you're doing. I'm, I'm very encouraged. I wish that more moms would do the kinds of things that you're doing and I, at NGIM, that's certainly one of the things that we wanna promote. Uh, I, I'm sure you've heard me say this because Growing up and learning from my father, I never had any doubts about my Christian faith ever. And, I, you know, I would certainly love to, you know, help parents get a hold of these resources so they can train their children so they their kids won't have any doubts. Or if they do, it won't be the big doubts that, you know, cause all the problems and them leaving uh, uh, the church after they leave college, which leads me kind of to my next question. And Christian, I want to ask you, um, tell me a little bit about your story. You know, you were a, you were a, a student of uh, Brian Henson at a Christian high school, and you were taught things. Did, did you know any of this before Brian taught you? <laughs> or, and how were you impacted by him? Um, and uh, how have you seen that influence in your thinking and values? Because now um, I understand you're going to a secular college. So I've just thrown about two or three questions at you. So go ahead and answer with the ones that 
you want to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before I met Brian, I hadn't been introduced to much Christian apologetics. Uh, I grew up in a Christian family. My name's Christian Paul. I went to a Christian school. So I, I, I've been a Christian for about as long as I can remember. I can't remember a time when I wasn't. Um, but I can definitely remember having doubts. Um, uh, but the doubts never really mattered to me growing up and in high school. Um, they really didn't matter to me until I started to want to want Christianity to not be true. Right. And that came about actually right about the time I met Brian, my sophomore year in high school. Um, I was taking his logic and debate class. And so that was the first time I was introduced to like uh, the arguments for Christianity. And those were um, very important for me staying in the faith. Um, be, uh, just because like I had motivation to leave, you know, like in high school, uh, sin is a very big objection to Christianity. It's a great motivating factor. Um to leaving. Um, but since I had those reasons to stay in the faith, um, it kept me grounded. Um, I didn't really, it, even if I wanted to leave Christianity, I knew I was going against reality. I had evidence um, that it was true. And that's been very important um, since I've come to college. Um, just having that foundation in uh, the evidence that Jesus did rise from the dead, that there is a God, that there is such a thing as truth. Um, and I'm actually president of a uh, of a of the Appalachian State chapter of a ministry called Ratio Christi, um, where we pretty much uh, introduce college to students to apologetics. And um, what we do, we have commit like uh, we have had non Christians become Christians as a result of our ministry. But I think the biggest thing about it has been um, keeping Christian, like having Christians remain Christians, because they get to college and everything in college is a whole entire different worldview. Yeah. Uh, truth is relative. You can't really know it. Morality is squishy. Right. Uh, there's a God if you want him to be around, you know, if that's comforting to you. Um, and so a lot of Christians have to compartmentalize. Um, and so being grounded in the faith lets you be of one mind. Um, so that, that's how I've, I've, I've seen uh, that, that grounding affect my life because I wasn't tossed around by those waves once I, I had reasons to be in the face. That's awesome. That's, that's really great. Um, yeah, I, I keep hearing stories about Brian, how Brian's impacting all these high school kids. And uh, uh, I, I was trying to remember the name. Who is the son of the pastor, Brian, who uh, was impacted by your life? You're talking about Derwin Gray? Derwin Gray's son. Derwin Gray. Yeah, was impacted by your uh, life, and uh, I've heard Derwin Gray on some kind of YouTube uh, channel or, or something where he he talks about that, how he talks about the impact that you've had on his son, and he's very thankful for that, and he makes the connection. In fact, I think he, even when my father was here, um, he would call my dad and uh, just say, you know, you impacted Brian Henson, and Brian Henson is now impacting my son. And he, he was just so excited to share that with my dad, how my dad had impacted his disciple, you, Brian, and then now you're impacting somebody else. So, um, you know, Brian, I could ask you a lot of questions just because of all the things I've learned about you and the impact you've had on so many people. Um, you know, in the last 15 years that you've taught high school kids. Um, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about your story, how you became a Christian, and maybe some of the struggles you went through even after you became a Christian, which is very different than my story. Um, you know, I didn't have the same experience as you, but I think it would be helpful for our audience to understand that. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so I teach at Charlotte Christian School, and at Charlotte Christian, I have so many opportunities of students that I get to meet. They're great guys like Christian, and Christian has always been a fighter. He's a state champion wrestler, by the way. <laughs> and Christian is one of the only guys that I know that he decided, and I still remember this from high school, that he, he did not want an iPhone. He had a flip phone so that he would not be tempted to you know search things online that he shouldn't be and i thought okay. man what a, what, a, what a great guy who's just trying to live out the faith but some guys just 
you know, I think he's always been a fighter. And so that's what he's doing with apologetics too, you know, and that's always, I feel like that's kind of described me as well. Well, I grew up here in Charlotte actually, and my mom was a strong Christian, but um, my dad, he left our family. My parents got divorced. And when he left, uh, my mom became a serious Christian. I mean, I was in fourth grade when he left, but you know, I, she raised me in church, but God, you know, mm-hmm. had his own way of reaching me mm-hmm. that as I got older and I started living, you know, a reckless, sinful life mm-hmm. um, in high school. And then when I, when I started in college, I was like that sin just tore my life to pieces, just wrecked my life. Mm-hmm. And God was orchestrating all of it. It's like, he was like this, this military strategist, this general who was like, okay, I'm going to hit Brian with this. I'm going to hit him with that, hit him with that. And everything that I needed to break me. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I went through what I did because it finally brought me to my knees, basically failed relationships one right after another. I don't want to get into all the details, but I, I got to the point where I just felt like I had no value. I was open to hearing my friend tell me about, about God. And so I had met this guy who was a serious Bible believing Christian and he was my own age and he wasn't corny about it. He, it really seemed like God was actually working in his life. And I would, I just started hanging out with him cause he's pretty cool. And he would pray and he would ask God, God, please send me people that you want me to, to reach. And it, it would happen. It happened like all the time. And it was the most bizarre thing that we would just be walking somewhere and somebody, people would just like, like vol- they wouldn't even know him. We just volunteered this information to him. And then he would start talking to me and start talking to him about Jesus. And, and I watched him do this to, with person after person. I was like, this guy has like this really cool, like adventurous life. And he would talk about God, like God was real, you know, because my thought was like, well, God doesn't talk to people in the Bible. <laughs> thing he did, but, but for this guy, God was, was talking to him providentially all the time through things in his life. Well, anyway, and so at the same time that my life was crumbling, it had to do with, you know, this you know, failed relationships with girlfriends, basically, that I was just like, I guess I'm, uh, I, had, I had a girl cheat on me and everything, just wrecked my life. And uh, I thought, you know what, um, instead of going on the rebound and just trying to go to another relationship as though that would be medicine, mm-hmm. I thought, I, I want to be like my friend. And I said, God, you know what, I've always heard that you love me but I don't love you. And mm. that's what you know what I need. And so then I became this radical born again, Christian, everything was different. Suddenly I, 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 I still would sin, but I had this conviction now. So everything was different. And I wanted to go share about Jesus with everybody. Mm. And as I would share my faith, I realized not everybody wanted to hear about Jesus. I was like trying to tell people about what what the Lord had done in my life and my transformed life and everything. And then people would be like, well, you know, we don't even know that Jesus lived. And I would be like, okay, he did. That wasn't anywhere on my radar to deal with that. And then people would ask like, well, if there's a God, is he powerful enough to create a rock that he's not powerful enough to lift? And I'm like, can you just stop it and listen to what I'm trying to say to you? I'm trying to give you jewels here. I'm trying to give, I'm trying to speak life into you. And you want to bring up all these nitpicky, weird little, little questions. And um, then people would start saying, well, all we have is a copy of a copy of a copy of the Bible. So we don't know what the Bible even really says. I'm like, it's like conversation after conversation. These kind of questions came up and I was like getting really frustrated. I was like, why are these people doing this? Why don't they just want to hear about God? And I began to realize that a lot of people were not Christians and they had reasons for it. And so I thought, you know what? I need to get better educated because I was a terrible student when I was in school. I need to get better educated. And so I decided, I ended up getting three majors at East Carolina University. I majored in religious studies. I thought that would help me reach people of other religions. But if you know anything about religious studies, Huh. It's basically getting a, a degree in why Christianity is false. <laughs> why all the other religions are nice and tolerant and why Christianity is just, you know, um, the evil crusaders and, and uh, intolerant and judgmental. And then I, I took these classes in Old and New Testament, and they couldn't just say, here's what the Old and New Testament are about. They had to argue that, you know, Moses didn't say any of this. We don't even know if he's real. And Jesus, he didn't say any of these. And look at these contradictions in the Bible. And I was like, are these contradictions? And so it started bothering me. And I was also an anthropology major and a history major. And so in my anthropology classes, my professors would 
they'd wheel in all these skulls and be like, look, if you line them up, looks like we, that's how we evolved. And they wouldn't just say that. They would then have to add, we used to think that there was a God that could explain how uh, humans or originated, but now we know that's not how it worked. And so I w- they kept taking shots at, at my faith and so I started asking my Christian friends, like, you know, how do we respond to this? And, and nobody knew. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew how to respond. And I would ask church leaders, and, you know, the best response I got was, well, Brian, if they're wrong, uh, and there is no God. Or if, if they're wrong and there is a God, they have everything to lose, and we don't. But if they're right and there is no God, we still have nothing to lose. I thought, but that doesn't prove that it's true, though. And if Islam is true, we have everything to lose. That means we're going to hell. So I need to know that too. But if there's some other religion that's right and I'm going to just get reincarnated and rebooted into the system. I I want to know these things. Uh, So it bothered me that nobody could answer these questions. And people didn't seem to care. And I thought, you know, these people must not be sharing their faith. Because when you share your faith, it comes up all the time, man. These questions. And a lot of them are now, I now know, are a lot of them are excuses but at that time, it really bothered me because I thought, you know, if I'm going to be intellectually honest, it really looks like Christianity is false because mm-hmm. it looks like we don't have the answers. And, and Christians would say things like, well, Brian, that's what faith is. You got to choose to believe. And I was just like, well, that sounds like surrender to me. <laughs> that sounds like, like we lost. It sounds like you don't have any answers. And so um, I ended up uh, having a friend say, well, I know a guy you need to talk to, and he was a guy that I already knew, um, about apologetics. And so he introduced me to apologetics, and he told me about Josh McDowell, the evidences for the faith. And as I started reading um, some of McDowell's books, I thought, man, this is where it's at, man. Look at the, the, Finally, somebody who cares, I could tell somebody who also had those questions. And so when apologetics was opened up to me, it was like this whole new world. And I got so excited, and I, at first I loved the evidential approach. I didn't know about the other approaches and we might get into that today too but I uh, ended up going to Wheaton College to study biblical archaeology and I you know lived in Israel for for six months and got to study actually in Israel and look at the evidences so it, re- it built my faith mm-hmm. and I thought you know this is what I want to do the rest of my life is I want to present people the evidences because really my passion is like yours David is mm-hmm. evangelism and so I got into apologetics for evangelism which is why your dad got into it too was for evangelism and that's and so many apologists don't evangelize and it's like why are you yeah why are you doing this but then um after after i taught for a few years in atlanta i learned about i taught bible in atlanta after i graduated from wheaton and i learned about southern evangelical seminary and then i went to ses and got trained even more so in apologetics and so now that's what i teach full time right that's great that's awesome you know Brian, I think it might be helpful, um, and actually why we wanted you to have you on the program tonight and to talk about uh, these issues is because you have developed some really great material for NGIM um, that's called Grounded, and it was designed in a way to um, help keep, uh, it was kind of our answer at NGIM to how to help to keep youth from leaving the church after college. I mean, that was kind of, when I approached you about this idea of doing this, um, that was what I was thinking. And and I believe this curriculum that you've developed um, called Grounded is so important because I believe that the devil has, um, you've heard me say this, two strategies for attacking church youth. One is uh, he attacks their thinking and the other, is uh, he attempts them in some kind of moral uh, area. So what I've learned over the years in doing college ministry in different parts of the globe is that that is his two-pronged strategy uh, for attacking church youth. Now, see, if the devil can get church youth to question whether God exists, what I've discovered, what I've observed, is that it's more difficult for them to resist all the moral temptations that they will face in college. So if we can at least answer their questions about God and Christianity and the Bible 
um, then at least when the moral temptations come, um, they have a fighting chance, mm-hmm. Ryan. But if they if they don't get these answers, they won't have a fighting chance anymore. Um, and that's why it's so important to train people in apologetics from a young age, like uh, Kaylee was mentioning Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7. That's why we got to do this, um, because we can't let our kids grow up and go to college, and then we lose them. I mean, the church has to wake up. Don't you think it's time? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, you know, I teach high school kids for a living, and I also speak at colleges. And one thing that I've, I've realized is that I can, a lot of times the, the, the high school kids are not as, sometimes they're not as interested as I want them to be. Uh, some are. I mean, you guys, you got guys like Christian and then, you know, Jeremiah uh, Gray, um, as you mentioned earlier, Durham Gray's son. But uh, a lot of times it begins at home because I have a lot of parents who come to me and they'll say, listen, my kid went off to college and they got involved with these friends who just attack the faith and the professors is going to reinforce that. And then they come home and they, they call me a bigot. They say that, that I that I hate all these people, um, you know, mm. they're going to say, you hate homosexuals. They're going to say all the, those sort of things. And they're like, well, what do I do? It's like, uh, I, I don't hate these people, but my, my kid has turned against me. What do I do? And a lot of times the parents are going to have to get equipped and they can't. There, there's, that's what grounded is, is, for, is for youth. Absolutely. Yes. But also parents and grandparents. Right. Right. Very good. So the good news is, I guess I should kind of give you the bigger picture uh, for our audience. Um, the good news is we've been given an immense, immensely valuable gift in the works of those who've kind of blazed a trail before us, you know, people like Billy Graham and R.C. Sproul. And my father has left a bunch of resources. And Brian, you're one of the resources he's, he's left us because of the impact he's had on your life. Um, and in fact, my father trained a generation of leaders who build a, uh, you know, who are building a foundational work that he developed. And uh, Brian, your grounded curriculum um, basically takes my father's deeper apologetic 12 points that show that Christianity is true tra- training and teach it in a way that attracts teens. Um, and parents, because I know that you've been teaching a lot of parents uh, your material as well, because once their kid finds out all this information, then the parent wants to, you know, to get grounded as well. And then you get all these opportunities to train the parents. I I just find that so fascinating. Um, Now, what is the 12 points? Well, the 12 points are 12 principles that basically establish uh, my father's classical apologetic model. Now, when he originally thought of this, he thought of this in terms of two steps, establishing the worldview of theism and using the lens of theism to look at the evidence for Christianity. But I understand, Brian, that, um, you know, that was in the 70s and 80s, but then um, things kind of changed and kind of the approach that you teach now is a three-step approach, which kind of, I guess my father clarified that um, in more specific ways. Could you clarify, talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, sure. That ba- the, the, the three steps would basically be, the first step is um, first establish the correct philosophical foundation. And right. then after that, the existence and attributes of God. And after that, the truth of Christian faith. Because if you if you start off with just the gospel, which is usually what would make sense to start off with, just yeah. to see what somebody is. Um, the, if you said something along, um, if you ended up getting to the point where you say something along the lines of Jesus died for your sins, uh, and they might say, well, I don't think Jesus existed. Well, then you have to give reasons for why Jesus existed. And then they might say, well, I don't even think God exists, though. And then you have to. So, so if you're trying to argue Jesus existed, you're in the third step, actually, the truth of Christian faith. And they go, well, I, I don't think God existed. Then you have to back up to the second step to argue that there's a God. Because if Jesus is going to be God incarnate, there has to be God. Right. And then they might say, well, 
you think God exists, but that's true for you, but not for me. Well, then you have to go back up to the very first step to argue that, well, if something is true, it's true for everybody. And so now you're in the step one, the philosophical foundation. And so um, you, you don't necessarily have to walk through somebody through all those steps, but if you right. want to reach a broader range of people, you're going to have to be able to do that because after the, you know, po now the postmodernism is mm -hmm. here, um, you know, postmodernism is going to say that you can't know the truth about reality or, or you only, you know, truth is not objective. It's only subjective. And so you have to be able to explain why, if the, why, if something, because we're going to claim that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, right. you would argue that truth is knowable right. and is real. Yes. Very good. I should also probably explain, Brian, to our listeners that uh, when you develop this grounded curriculum, I, I encourage you to test it out so that we can find out if, you know, if it's really uh, designed in a way to make a difference. And I remember you taught this in a, a church. Uh, it was kind of a church plan, actually. And there were uh, 30 Asian youth you taught this to originally for nine weeks, one hour each week. And at the end of those nine sessions, you told me that of those 30 youth, five of them actually pray to receive Christ and two actually uh, rededicated their life to Christ. So I knew when you had told me what had happened, you know, with this uh, test run, that this curriculum was going to have an impact on so many people because it was designed in a way to really challenge these kids to think about what they believe and why they believe it and get the answers to their questions, but then to go further and challenge them then to grow spiritually. Um, and so I was just so encouraged about that. Um, so I'd like for us to talk a little bit about those nine sessions and like, like to hear you uh, talk about how to apply those teachings to uh, to help others. How have you done that, and uh, how can we use those to ground ourselves in our faith? I know that's a lot of content; those nine uh, subjects. But maybe you kind of maybe summarize that a little bit for us. Um, but before we do that, <laughs> I want to show a short video clip. Uh, from the grounded curriculum so that people can get a better idea of what it is that you actually talk about in this training video. So let's watch this. Raise your hand if you say there's one God and three gods at the same time. I see about maybe a third of hands. So Christian logic goes like this. One plus one plus one is one. Here's the problem. God simply is not detectable through any human means. You have faith, I have science. I'm on the science team, and the math team, and the logic team, you should come join me. Why do you even believe in the Bible? If you ask that to a Christian, he's gonna say, because the Bible is the word of God. Well, how do you know the Bible is the word of God? Because the Bible tells me so. But why do you believe the Bible? Because it's the word of God. How do you know it's the word of God? Because the Bible says so. Why do you believe, see this, this is circular reasoning. It's ungroundable. You have no good reasons for believing in the Bible. You just inherited the faith that you have from your parents. We are sending out our young people to college unprepared. We are sending them out to the wolves, and they are getting ripped to pieces. We are losing the next generation. The baton is not being handed down to the next generation. That's very good stuff, uh, Brian. Now, the good news is that we can all play a part in influencing the next generation of Christian leaders. And as you know, the battle begins at home. So one of the things that we're doing tonight is we're going to offer the grounded curriculum at half off uh, uh, for our listeners. Uh, this was recently launched as a self-paced workshop through the Norm Geisler Institute. So what you need to do if you're interested um, is to go to ngim.org slash institute and click on workshops. Right there at the top, you'll see the grounded workshop and use the code live grounded, live grounded, and grounded is all capitals uh, to access this for 50% off. Um, and uh, this is something that I wish every Christian parent would get a hold of. 
uh, to equip uh, their kids. Um, and as you know, Brian, um, because of what my father taught me, you know, you know, I, I had, you know, I taught my kids when they were younger, a lot of, of these similar kinds of principles, maybe not to the same depth as your grounded material, but just some basic uh, ideas, uh, especially, you know, based on those 12 points that show that Christianity is true. Um, now, uh, as we talked about before, that my father called this classical apologetics, and uh, originally it was the two-step approach, and now he kind of made it into a, a three-step approach, and then that's kind of how you you learned it as a three-step approach. So maybe just kind of go through each of those three different uh, sections a little bit, and then explain them in a little more detail. And then uh, Kaylee and Christian, maybe you can just, you know, give our listeners some feedback from your perspective of your understanding about these three um, basic uh, uh, ideas that Brian teaches. Sure. And uh, in the uh, Grounded Seminar, I try to use a lot of visuals so you can kind of see what I'm talking about because it's so abstract, the concepts that, that we use, that if you can kind of see these these abstract things represented in symbols and i try to use some humor because i know that after a while kids you're gonna lose kids um, attention unless you try to be a little bit funny so i was playing devil's advocate there in that that uh clip that, that david showed where i try to pretend like i'm an atheist and i was attacking their faith mm -hmm. um but for the for the very first step the philosophical foundation we talk about well how do you discover the truth about reality because the bible assumes that and teaches that, yeah, you can discover the truth about reality. Well, what we do is God designed us humans as physical beings that we have to use our senses to access the world that I can, I can see, I can hear, whatever, and I can access the world that way. And from there, I kind of extract these principles and these principles are not physically seen. And the reason why that's important is because somebody might say, well, I only use science and you Christians just use your faith. And right. I try to explain, well, you don't just use science because you actually use philosophy. The philosophy actually is the missing part. That is the one discipline that actually touches every single discipline is philosophy. Right. Um, and so that's why you got to know some philosophy. Like somebody says, well, I only use science. Okay. No, you don't. Do you use science to prove that the scientific method did you use science to prove atheism i mean did you see atheism did you smell atheism you didn't that's not something you can use science for so what i argue is that there's these there's a lot of principles that you don't see that you extract mentally kind of like a, a dog like dogs are pack animals right you observe the behavior of dogs and you conclude they're pack animals but you didn't see pack animalness as though that was a physical thing that you saw like, did you smell pack animalness? Did you? I guess you can smell dogs, right? <laughs> but you don't smell pack animalness. You don't see that. Uh, you can't touch that. That's a that's an abstract idea. Something like triangularity. That you see triangles, but triangularity. What does that look like? That's an abstract idea. So uh, the reason why I go through that is to say, yeah, I don't, I don't see God, but I, but I extract these principles. Right. And after I extract these principles, then I build the case that there's a God. For example, we look at this universe because I can't look at God. I don't have direct access to God's essence to look at, smell, or whatever. But I do have access to this universe, and that's how God designed it, which is what Romans 1 says. That we're designed to look at this universe and figure out that there's a God. So I look at this universe, and from there I can extract, for example, that everything that begins to exist as a cause. Right. That the universe began to exist, right. that, uh, the, you know, Big Bang cosmology, that you can right. use scientific arguments for that, that the universe had a beginning. Well, if everything that begins has a cause, right. if we extract that principle, and then the universe began, that means the universe had a cause. Well, if the universe had a cause, that means something is prior to the universe that already existed, that acted to cause the universe to begin to exist. Right. Well, if the universe didn't, the universe can't cause itself to exist. Right. Something prior to it did. And if the universe didn't bring itself into existence, then the universe is not 
currently keeping itself in existence either. So if the, if the universe didn't cause itself to begin, it's not currently keeping itself in existence either. So whatever caused the universe to begin, that's the same being that's keeping it in existence right now. And I remember your dad um, walking me through or walking our whole class through the arguments for God's existence and hearing your dad give the cosmological argument and talk about, I don't have time to get into it here with potentiality and actuality. Right. It changed my life. I mean, it actually changed my life in so many ways. I would say, and this may sound strange, but I would say even healing some of my depression, even healing all wow. kinds of things, just because it, it, it helped me understand what kind of being God is. I remember your, your dad explaining that all of this means that God is causing our existence. He caused the universe to begin. He's currently causing it. And there has to be a being. It can't be that everything has a cause. Right. If everything had a cause, nothing would exist. Right. Um, and he explained that there has to be something that's uncaused. Right. And if there's something that's uncaused, it's a thing that always just exists. Mm -hmm. And if it always exists, then one of these, one of the, this being's attributes would be existence. That this being is existence. And that means that we exist in God. And that blew me away. I was like, oh, God is existence. And all these Bible verses, like in him, we move and, and uh, you know, live and have our being. Like we exist in God. All these Bible verses actually will say things like that. But I always kind of pictured it as though, like, I exist and God is that we're both in existence. And that God was kind of like, I wish Brian knew that I was in existence, too, with him. But the, and I remember your dad saying that most of us have like a Santa Claus view of God. Or like a Greek God. Right. This is the infinite one. This is Yahweh that we're talking about here. This right. is the one who is the I am, the one that just is, the one that is existence itself. And that's what God is. God, and so uh, one of my atheist friends, former atheist friends, John Webster, he might even be watching now. I remember him asking one time, David knows what I'm talking about. He, he said, uh, what is the greatest evidence for God's existence? And I said, existence. That's actually what it is. That's what God is. So God is being itself, existence itself, that God is currently causing all things to have existence. That's the greatest evidence for God's existence is existence itself. Anyway, so from there, uh, after we talk about that, how do you ground God's existence? Then, uh, th so the third step ends up being, well, how do you know that the Christian faith is true? So there's three basic steps that we go through to argue for the truth of Christian faith which the first one is that the Bible is historically reliable. So we don't start off trying to argue that the Bible is, although we do believe the Bible is inerrant and inspired, I can't just start there sometimes with somebody. Uh, so we argue that it's at least generally reliable, historically reliable. And then from there, we show that, uh, that, that it records that Jesus did miracles and fulfilled prophecies. And the fulfilled prophecies are really what have sold me once and for all intellectually that, that Christianity is true. You know, the guardians for God's existence, there's got to be a God, but those fulfilled prophecies, if you look at how detailed they are, it is so cool. Isaiah 53 is like a miniature gospel. It just walks right through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, all of that. Daniel 9, predicting the date of the Messiah's death. All of these together show that the Bible has supernatural origin. And then we go through the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus that historians don't say Jesus never lived. In fact, historians, over 70% of historians affirm that the tomb is empty. Right. And historians also will say the disciples really seem to believe that they saw Jesus. So we have these, these two main facts to go on here, that the tomb was empty. That's why they're saying that somebody stole the, the body. Um, and also, something happened to the disciples where they really thought they saw him. So the tomb is empty, and they really thought they saw him, and they were willing to actually die for their claims. Right. We suddenly, using the historical method, have a really strong argument that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, whatever he, then that, that would mean God is vindicating, verifying his whole ministry. And since Jesus, in the historically reliable book, the Bible, since it teaches that Jesus claim to be God, and God verifies those claims by his fulfilling prophecy, miracles, resurrection. That means he's God. And then 
since Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God, that means the Bible is the word of God. And so that's basically the three-step method, which really is based on your dad's 12 points. Right, right. Very good. So Christian, let me just ask you this. When you begin to understand these three parts to establishing um, our faith as, as a Christian, did that, you know, Brian said that, uh, you know, he, he wasn't as depressed and he was more hopeful. What, what happened? I'm just curious, like in, in high school, when he kind of put these things together, I remember Andy Stanley, who I went to seminary with, um, he, he told me in the interview we had with him for the documentary on my dad's life that he realized after he left the class, after my dad taught him all this apologetics, he said, I always thought, you know, God was, it was true that he existed, but now I know. And it was just this amazing thing for him. And it, it was transformational. So I'm just curious, like what happened in your life when you began to hear Brian start talking about all these and it started to make sense to you even more? Oh, it, it changes everything. Um, for one, it, it makes you live out your faith consistently. Um, because now your faith isn't squishy anymore. It isn't just what you want it to be. Um, you actually have obligations to your creator um, and a charge to share your faith, right. which help you learn more apologetics. Um, but I think the real important thing for teaching kids this is because if, um, if your high schooler doesn't get grounded in this worldview before he goes to college, his college professors will give him a worldview, him or her a worldview. And it's not gonna be like God's not dead. There's not going to be a professor up there. God doesn't exist, and uh, y'all should challenge me, and I'll argue about it. Um, I've had, like, two professors in my college career that were like that. What it's more like is those more philosophical things. Like, it's taken as a matter of course that truth is relative or that looking for truth is meaningless or not very helpful. So you pretty much get a lot of arguments for why things are bad and terrible, but no good comprehensive worldview. And like Hinton said, that's very depressing. Um, I was shocked my freshman year of college, just how many kids in my dorm alone had committed suicide. Oh, wow. Um, let alone on my campus. And it's a thing no one really talks about. Um, the, the two main causes of college student death are injuries uh, while intoxicated and suicide. Um, and so why are college students drinking so much and why are they killing themselves? Um, we can go into a lot of reasons for that, but for one, um, on campus, not just in the classroom, but just like on a college campus in general, you're getting a postmodern worldview where nothing is actually solid. Um, and if, if you've been squishy, you know, teaching your kids why the Christian faith is true, um, then they're going to be convinced by other squishy reasons. Um, when they do get to college and they actually have motivation to abandon the Christian faith. Yeah. So um, when you get to college, there's a lot of talk about mental health and having, you know, you know, to prevent suicide and over drinking, but they don't have a worldview to actually give a reason right. uh, to not be depressed, you know? Oh. So it's not just a matter of staying a Christian. It, it literally can be a, a matter of um, your quality of life and even life of death, life and death when, oh. when your kid gets to college. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Can, I, can I point something out that uh, highlights something that, that uh, Christian just said? Um, because I think he hit on something really important. A lot of times, if somebody is just attacking my faith and they're saying, here's why your faith is false. It's like my guard goes up. It's like, all right, my guard's up. He's attacking. But when, like Christian said, it's those little subtleties, like there's assumptions, like, of course, there's no God. Of course, nature's all there is. Or of course... Right. You know, the truth mm -hmm. is unknowable. Then your guard is actually down yeah. and you realize it, but it's like these, this worldview is sneaking in through the back door. So a lot of times uh, uh, we've got to train our kids how to recognize these little subtle assumptions that somebody has that right. that's actually still trying to sneak, you know, the enemy soldiers into my, into my, my, uh, into my castle. Right. Yeah. That's very good. It's yeah, and I, I don't mean to, to, to hate on the movie God's Not Dead. It's just not very realistic of how it happens. If it happened that way, you'd probably have a lot more Christians right. <laughs> in college, in my opinion. Right. But, 
So Kaylee, let me ask you a question. Uh, I guess it would be helpful to tell our listeners, uh, your husband, um, uh, Anthony, is a graduate of SES. And actually, you guys are, uh, Anthony is one of our certified trainers in the Northeast of uh, the US. And he's a pastor and uh, he was trained in all this apologetics. So when did you learn some of this? And how did this all impact you? I guess you learned it from your husband. Is that true? Yes. Well, um, it, before him, um, I was exposed to it a little bit uh, later on through my parents. Right. Um, when I was in high school, my dad started a college and career Sunday school class. And he used uh, some of Norman Geisler's books to uh, teach that class. So... Uh, my so my parents did expose me a little bit, but that wasn't until later on. I mean, growing growing up, I I would have been you know the kid that said, oh well, I believe the Bible is the word of God because the Bible says it's the word of God, right. and I would have had no one ever questioned me, and thank goodness no one did because I wouldn't have known how to answer them. I, I just had that circular reasoning. Right. Um, but now through my husband, I've learned so much. Um, so again, it started briefly with um, my parents and then um, my husband and my husband's brother were in my dad's Sunday school class. And so this is, uh, a, it was about, um, yeah, about like 10 years or so, give or take, uh, when I really started getting involved um, into uh, the world of apologetics. Mm. And I'm so glad now that I know, um, because all around me, I'm starting to see all these questions that people have. And I'm, I'm starting to see, uh, even in myself, uh, that I didn't necessarily have as solid of a foundation as I thought I did. Mm. And it, it wasn't, you know, anyone's fault in particular. Um, it really goes back to some of more of these like ph philosophy um, points and just the, the sneakiness of it all yeah. um, in which we're being bombarded all around us now with false ideas and uh, bad philosophy. So now my eyes through my husband um, and what, uh, through him sharing everything that he's learned and through um, being more involved with NGIM, I'm able to be trained and I, I can see all this. And I thank God so much for that because it, as it's already been talked about, it, it's life-changing. And it's simple things, you know, everyone, I don't wanna say everyone, but a lot of people are like, oh, philosophy is bad or I don't want to talk about it but when you start talking about things like when Brian was talking about like God is existence himself wow. like that is amazing I know. and no one talks about it and it's it is life-changing yeah yeah do you remember um, um hearing from Anthony something that my father taught me is this principle that I try to simplify the cosmological argument if uh, if something exists, uh, you know, you and I exist, and if something can't come from nothing, then something must have always existed. Because if there ever was a time in the very beginning when there was nothing, there would still be nothing now. And I don't know, but that little phrase that my father taught me you know, that simplified all these uh, heavy arguments. And it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Why is there something right now rather than nothing? You know, is because something eternally always existed. Because if it didn't, we wouldn't be here. Now, the Hindus and Buddhists believe that we are part of that something that always existed. And in fact, you know, the Hindus believe that what we see in life is maya, it's an illusion. It's, you know, the idea of plurality is an illusion. And they believe that reality is beyond good and evil. So they don't even believe in good and evil. So it's like, you know, how can you live your life with these kinds of beliefs that are, you know, just that don't make sense, that don't correspond to reality. And so my father taught me that principle. And and then he taught me that Colossians 1, 17 says, in him, in Jesus, all things hold together, that God 
is holding us into existence at this very moment. And if he would withdraw his hand from our existence, you and I wouldn't exist. And, you know, Brian and Christian, that just, that boggled my mind when I first began to understand what he was saying about that. And back in the 70s through 90s, my father was one of the few peoples <laughs> that had a more sophisticated argument for, uh, for Christianity. Everyone was still talking about just the evidence for Jesus. Because by that time, people were still accepting a Judeo-Christian worldview perspective. And then as we got into the 80s and 90s, it, they moved away from that and, and, and towards a more a naturalistic perspective. So, Brian, uh, I, I realize we're almost out of time. So just one other question. Why is it that this naturalistic worldview is so prevalent in our world today? Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with the collapse of classical philosophy. Classical philosophy being the, the philosophy of Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, those guys, that once we start getting into the modern age, you know, science is great, but uh, once you start cutting philosophy out and you start only using the natural sciences, then you, it's like a whole other category of thought is, is removed because all of the arguments, the, the way you ground the Christian faith is you, you're gonna to have to use classical philosophy. When you cut that out, then you argue that science is the only way to know the truth about reality. Yeah. If the natural science is all you have, what do the natural sciences study? Right. Nature, that's all, they, that's all they're gonna study. And so then suddenly nature right. is, is, is all there is. Yeah. Um, and you know, just one more point about, you know, how in the world would knowing that God is existence itself, how would that actually make me less depressed uh, a lot of it is, I think that when I, when your dad explained to me that we are beings that are potential and actual beings, um, but another being had to be an actual being that actualized my potential to bring me into existence. Right. Eventually, there has to be a being that's pure actuality that has right. no potential. So that being is God does not have the potential to move from here to here. He's right. actualized existence here and here. He doesn't have the potential to learn. He actually knows everything. The reason why that was so um, uh, helpful for me just mentally was if that's the kind of God that exists, then right. that God can have full control and all of my problems, he can actually handle all of them because he is the pure actualized infinite I am, the Yahweh. I can trust that guy. Yeah, yes. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well, our time has ended. So let me just uh, share some thoughts in closing. Um, I believe that, uh, as you guys know, my father was influential in impacting many lives, not just by what he taught, but how he also lived his life with the Christ first mindset. And this is something I'm very thankful he modeled for me. Uh, you see, my dad understood clearly that it wasn't just our persuasive words that changes people's lives, but also how we live our lives in the midst of a watching world. Um, and as a result, he helped me to see that when we teach apologetics, you know, we have to teach the importance of being a Christ first disciple as well. And that's why we at NGIM want to cultivate generations who actively put Christ first. So, you know, looking at scripture, it's very important as parents that we play an important role in the home in instructing our children. And so I appreciate all your input tonight. And um, I think maybe the message we want to leave people is this. It's time for all of us to pass on the baton. So from all of us at NGIM, good night.